good morning. My name is Miguel, uh, and I'm here to, uh, to talk about mastering your tools. Uh, my talk is about productivity, how to be better at your work, uh, at least if that work is about writing code, which I believe most of us here do. Uh, I work at a company called Subvisual. Uh, we have an op uh, we li live in Braga, uh, and we're now opening an office in Boston. Uh, we've been there in the, uh, since the past few months. Uh, and we're a design and development com company. Um, but besides our work, we also do uh, organize a few events. Uh, you may have heard of MirrorConf, which happened uh, a couple of weeks ago in Braga, and was a huge success. And we're also organizing uh, RubyConf Portugal, uh, uh, which is going to its third edition now. Uh, it's happening at the end of this month, and we have speakers like Martin Fowler, which you may not, may heard of. Uh, I have stickers and discount codes for this one uh, at the end of the talk, if anyone's interested. Uh, but back to the subject. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm here to talk about writing code, not about uh, what code you write or what you write it for, but how you write it, what tools you use, and how you use them. Uh, I've always been very obsessed with this subject because I, I spend a lot of, a lot of time uh, researching new tools, trying to figure out uh, better ways to, to use the ones I use. Um, so I research a lot of this. I, I actually think I spend way too much time on uh, optimizing my, my workflow. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to mostly be talking about my tools, what I use. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not here to say that what I use is uh, uh, what everyone else should use. I'm just going to show uh, a, a few examples of how I do my work, what tools do I use, and hopefully you can get so, some inspiration for, uh, from that. I don't care if you use something as complex as NetBeans or something as slim as Windows Notepad. Uh, if, you're pro if you're productive using whatever it is you use, then it's fine. Although. It probably won't be fine uh, with Notepad, let's be honest. Um, but with that said, uh, the tools I use the most and the ones I'm going to be talking about here are Vim and Tmux. Uh, anyone here uh, knows or works with this? Besides the guys that came from my company? OK, a couple of hands. Uh, so Vim is a text editor. Uh, it goes back all the way from to 1991, I believe. Uh, even if you don't use it, you probably heard of it. It's, it has a, a very steep learning curve, which is probably the only reason why I don't recommend it to newcomers, unless they have the time and uh, energy to spend learning this. Uh, or, if they, or if they're using Emacs, I also recommend them switching to Vim. Uh, but uh, other, other than the steep learning curve, uh, it's the best editor I've ever used, and I'm, I don't think I'll change uh, uh, very soon. And Tmux uh, stands for Terminal Multiplexer. Uh, it, it basically allows me to have splits and tabs on my terminal. If you use iTerm or some other modern uh, emulator, you, you also get these features. Tmux is just another alternative, and it's the one I use. So the examples I'm going to be showing here today are mostly using these two tools. And uh, as an example, I'm going to use a Rails app, our company's blog. Uh, but but you, you don't need any specific knowledge of any of these tools to get something out of this. I just hope you, you see how you do a couple of things and maybe you get a, a new idea of something tr to try out or maybe you see something that you didn't know could be done that fast or uh, using a particular tool and maybe you get some inspiration out of this. So the first thing, concrete thing I'm going to talk about is navigation, how I basically how I move ar around in my computer. Uh, I noticed that I have a very particular system for, for this when I, uh, when, I, when I first worked with a MacBook, because I mostly use Linux. And one time, a couple of years ago, I was forced to uh, use a MacBook for a couple of months for a project. And I noticed that the, the way I was used to doing things uh, I couldn't replicate that on, on a MacBook uh, for multiple reasons. Maybe I just didn't search uh, long enough. Um, but that's when I noticed that I have a very particular system and uh, I, I was very productive with it and couldn't really get away from it. This is a picture of my desktop uh, at our office in Braga. Uh, the only thing I want to mention here is that I, use, I'm, I, I usually use two screens. On the left, I, I always have a terminal, which in that case is running Tmux. 
On the right, I have a browser. Since I mostly do web development and I use Vim inside the terminal, this is mostly what I use uh, all day long. So I, I don't need any, any other window open. Anything else I use, like Slack or Spotify, that I have open during the day is, goes to secondary desktops so that I don't, it doesn't interfere with my flow. I just focus on this, these two windows. I also have two MacBook boxes. Those are the only Apple products I use right now. <laughs> um, so I use multiple desktops. And by this, I don't mean the two screens. I mean the virtual desktops that we, we probably all use. Uh, but in one, of, in one of those desktops, I have Tmux, which has splits and tabs. Uh, and in some of those splits, I'll probably have Vim running, which also has Vim's uh, splits and tabs. So this can get a little bit messy, because I have all this uh, in inception of splits and tabs. And it, it can be hard to manage, uh, unless I come up with a, a good system for remembering how to navigate with it. Uh, one thing, I, I try never to use the mouse, because it tends to make me slower. So uh, anything I'm going to talk about is, here is how I navigate using just a keyboard. So what I do is I try to assign one meta key for each of those concepts. For example, any, any shortcut that I use to navigate uh, within my desktops, I use the super key for it. Uh, inside Tmux, I use the alt key for, for the, the same kind of shortcuts. And then in Vim, I use the control key. So I know that if I want to navigate, uh, let's say, switch, switch a tab in Tmux, I'm, I'm, it's a shortcut that uses the alt key. If it's a tab in Vim, it will use the control key. And it's pretty easy to remember that way. Uh, as for navigation itself, uh, I, I use these, two, these four keys to move around uh, as my arrow keys. And to, to explain why, uh, since most of you don't use Vim, I'll have to go back a few years. So this is a picture of the, the, uh, the keyboard from a computer whose name I can't remember. But it was the computer where Vim was developed in. And you can notice that uh, this keyboard, or most keyboards at the time, didn't have arrow keys at all. They had the, the arrow keys embedded right here. So when, when the guy who created Vim uh, was creating it, he, he had to manage with, with these four. And since they're in the home row, uh, it's called the home row, the, the middle row of the keyboard, it's, uh, it's where your uh, hands rest by default when you're using a keyboard. They're really comfortable to use because your, your hands are already in place. And so they take almost no effort. It's pretty much easier to get used to using these keys than to go all the way back to the arrow keys and moving your hand around a lot. Uh, so Vim started using these keys, and they were uh, adopted. And still, nowadays, anyone who, use, who uses Vim seriously ends up using these keys. And so what I did was I adopted these keys for all my navigation. So anything that, that is about moving left and right uh, in my computer, uh, up and down as well, I use those four keys. And I added a couple of things, which is about, since I also have tabs, I, I added a couple of keys, U and I, uh, to switch tabs. The only reason for choosing U and I is because they're right above, as you can see, they're right above the, the four keys. So they're, they're also easy to access and remember. And so like, uh, with this and the meta keys thing I was, tell, I was telling about, it's pretty easy for me to remember how to navigate. If I want to go to the left, uh, left split on Tmux, it's the Alt key and H for left, so it's Alt H. If I want to go to the left split on Vim, it's Control H. If I want to go to the left desktop on, on my Linux, it's uh, Super H. Same thing for all these keys. And so this gets pretty easy to remember. So the only, uh, my only advice he, uh, here about not only navigation but shortcuts in general is to set up a system and stick with it. I often uh, get ideas for other shortcuts to create that, that I would maybe uh, like to use, but I couldn't really fit on my system either, either because the key that I would remember is already being used by some other thing, or uh, it's, it's in a key that's not really comfortable to access. And so at that point, I just forget about that shortcut because I know in the long run, I'm not going to remember about it. So the next thing I want to talk about is something called the feedback loop. This is a concept about how long it takes between uh, you having a thought, thinking about doing something, then do, actually doing it, and then seeing the result happening so you can then uh, work on it again. And this, this is something we do all the time uh, when we're programming. 
we can be changing a line of CSS and we have to wait or refresh the browser to see uh, if it worked and then ch uh, change something again. Or it can be something as complex as compiling an, like an Arduino, Arduino program, uh, running it on the hardware and see, seeing if it worked correctly. Uh, this loop always exists and is something that we, we're doing all the time, even if it takes two seconds or two minutes. Uh, it, it happens uh, all the time in our, in our daily workflow. So this is the one thing that I try to optimize the most. And one, one simple way to optimize this, I mean, remove, uh, remove some work out of this so that uh, it takes me less time between my thoughts and my results, basically. Uh, a simple action for this is to create shortcuts, which uh, probably everyone here no knows what those are. This can go uh, all the way from very simple aliases in, in your terminal to more complicated scripts to automate uh, entire, entire workflows, for example. And for this, I only have two rules. The first rule is keep it simple, stupid. This is uh, actually called the, print, the KISS principle. Uh, this basically tells you to don't overcomplicate because otherwise you, you won't remember what you, uh, what you set up. And the second rule is to set up reminders. One useful trick I've learned about uh, creating shortcuts and uh, other commands is to always have, for example, a post-it next to my desktop with, uh, let's say, five shortcuts that I'm trying to, to learn. As I keep working, I'm going to sometimes look at the, uh, the post-it by accident and, say, and go, oh, I, I can use this one right now and I use it, uh, and eventually that, that goes into my muscle memory, so I never have to really remember uh, about using those. They just com come in naturally, and at that point, I can just remove the post-it and add a couple new shortcuts that I want to learn, and that way I can lear uh, keep learning a few things at a time uh, without much effort. So like I was saying, shortcuts can be some really simple stuff. For example, uh, I use G as an alias in my terminal for Git, which is by far the command I use the most. It, I think it amounts to 26% of, of all the commands I type in, in my terminal. So even, even though this was just three characters, say, uh, reducing that down to just one saves me a, quite a lot of time, considering how much I use Git. I also have other, other alias for other programs I use often. But I also have uh, more complicated stuff. For example, there are two things that I do all the time, which is opening pull requests on GitHub and merging them. And these are not just sing single commands. I do this from the command line as well. I, I rarely go to, to GitHub other than to post comments. But this is a really, um, these are more complicated scripts because they, re um, for example, push, push a pull request requires me to push the, the commits to GitHub unless they're all already there. Opening a pull request on GitHub, there's a plugin that helps me do, do this as well. Create a, a pull request message, which is ne not necessarily the same as the commit message, um, and publishing all that. Closing a pull request, we have a, our own defined workflow. We need to rebase the, rebase the branch with master. We need to squash everything, probably edit the commit message, uh, push, first push the branch again to update on GitHub, then merge the branch. Uh, Etc. So, oh, and at the end, uh, delete the, the remote branch. So this is quite a lot of work, and, but it's always the same kind of work. So I ended up automating this into a single, a single command. G is the alias for Git, and then CPR is another alias I did, which Git allows me to do. Uh, I, I did a script called Git close pull request, and then an, an, an alias like this for that. And so with these five characters, I can just uh, close an entire pull request with all that workflow. I actually have a blog post about this, in, in, uh, about this script in my company's blog, if you want to look at it later. So as a recap uh, about shortcuts, I, I just recommend that you keep, keep them simple and set up reminders so that you don't have to force yourself to learn things and that you just end up learning them naturally. Next, I want to talk about uh, how to find stuff. And by this, I mean how to find files, that, that file that you're trying to, to edit, or inside that file, the, the specific line that you're trying to edit. There's actually a lot of tools for this that I use, especially in my workflow with Vim. Other editors, such as Visual Studio and NetBeans, have their own features for this. Uh, I've never used them, them much, but I, I, f I find that the tools I use, at least for me, they seem to be a bit faster. Uh, maybe it's just that I'm not searching enough. 
So I'm going to talk about a, a couple of small tools that I, that I use uh, for how I, how I do this. Um, this is a tool called FZF, which stands for Fuzzy Finder. Fuzzy Finding, fuzzy finding if you, uh, if you don't, don't know what it means, it allows me to search typing a, a query uh, that instead of typing an, the exact name for a file, for example, I can just type an approximate uh, name. And the fuzzy find will try to find the best matches that match the, the, qu the query I typed. So it's really, it's really simple uh, and easy to use when I, I don't really remember the exact name of the file, but I remember that it had the, the, the word user in there somehow or something like that. And it gives me all the, ma uh, all the matches that I can easily choose from. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demo this stuff in a bit. I'm just going through the, the tools uh, really quick for now. Uh, Next, uh, there's a tool I use to find code. This is about not finding uh, the code by their file names, but by their content. So for example, I might, want, I might, I might want to find in my project all the occurrences of a function, uh, a function call that I, that I defined. For this, there are two, uh, two tools I, I recommend the most. Agia also stands, uh, they call it the silver searcher. Uh, is, a, is, the, um, a, is a bit older, but it's still one of the fastest ones. Uh, Hipcrep is a tool called in, uh, made in Rust, which was released just a couple of weeks ago, as far as I know. And they basically allow you to index, I mean, not index, but quickly search all your code um, uh, by, by, the, by their content, by the content of all your files. And it's really, it's really fast. Uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't expect this to be as, as fast as it is, but um, I never had any performance problems with this. I also use something called Vim Projectionists. This is, what, uh, this is a specific thing for Vim, but I, I imagine that we, uh, you can easily find, find or create similar tools for uh, other editors. This is a tool that, among other things, allows me to, cre uh, to create uh, or to define uh, alternate pairs of files based on their names. So for example, in, in Rails, I might have a, a file called user.rb, which is a user model. And the corresponding tests for that user are going to be user underscore spec.rb. So I can define, uh, with a couple of re uh, regular expressions, define a match that associates each model file with the corresponding spec file. And then Vim Projectionist gives me a, uh, a few shortcuts in Vim that allow me to easily switch between the, the two or open from the model, open the corresponding spec files in a, uh, vertically on the side. So I can easily navigate between those uh, without having to even remember where they are. And the last thing is C tags. This is a, a really old tool as well. It comes from the, the, day, the C days. But they, they, it works really well with uh, more modern languages such as Ruby. And what this, what this does is index, indexes all your code, not only on your project, but it can also index external libraries and allow you to quickly jump from uh, a function that you're calling to, to its definition, to find where, where it is defined. Uh, I'm going to demo all this. Uh, all of these tools right now, assuming this works properly. Okay. So I'm in a project that this is the, the source code for our company's blog. It, uh, it's open source uh, as well on GitHub. Uh, it's made in Rails. So FCF, the first tool I was talking about, is really simple. I can call FCF, and this by default shows me all the matches for the current query in, in my project. Since I didn't type anything, the current match is all the files in my project, basically. But as I type, this finds all the files that match the current query I'm typing. And this is really, really, really fast. I never had any performance problems. Um, and like I said, since it's, this is first fuzzy search, I don't need to type an exact word. I can just type parts of the word, and it finds the files that match it somehow. So it's really, really useful. Uh, the other tool is HipGrep, uh, or Agia. Uh, HipGrep, I call it with uh, RG. Uh, and I, I can pass it a string. For example, let's call it with subvisual. And this is going to find in my code all occurrences of the subvisual keyword. Uh, there's a lot of garbage right now because it, it basically found the, the 500 HTML file, but I can easily filter this to look f only for Ruby files, for example. So now it's finding all the occurrences of subvisual in my actual Ruby code. And all of this works well inside Vim. I'm going to open Vim right now in this project, and I can easily type, uh, I've assigned this to Control-P, 
And if I type control, I mean, sorry, live demos, I need to. So like I was saying, I can type control P and FZF uh, works well with Vim. It opens a, a preview here that I can uh, use just like I used outside of Vim. I find a match, I type enter and I, I'm inside the file. And that's real, really, really easy. Uh, and this is something I, I couldn't do, for example, in Visual Studio. Uh, if, if there is a way to do this this fast, please let me know, seriously, because I, I struggled a lot with this. Um, the other thing is uh, hip grab. Now, like I said, here I'm just searching for file names, but with hip grab, I can search for the whole content. So like I did outside of Vim, I can type command control F, and I can start typing subvisual, and it finds me all occurrences of subvisual in all my files. In this case, I'm not filtering uh, with Ruby files because I can't add flags here. But wh what I can do is, since this is filtering the, the whole line, which includes the, f the file name, I can do a quick, a small trick, which is to type .rv subvisual. And since this is fuzzy search as well, this uses both hipgrep and fzf. This is, this is finding a any file that has .rv subvisual uh, with a fuzzy search, so it ends up working pretty much in the same way. Uh, the other tool I was, I was going to talk about is C tags. So let's say I'm in my user model, and I have this method called name, which just takes the first and last name, joins them together, and strips uh, white spaces uh, in the beginning and end. Uh, this strip method is not, is not defined by by my code, it's from an external library. But, but I can easily type a shortcut, and it goes to, all the way to my gem, which is defined somewhere in my RVM directory. It's defined by a gem called formatador, which I don't even know what that is. But I can easily jump to its definition, even though I can't add, uh, I probably shouldn't edit this, I can easily see what it's doing. And then I can easily type control T and go back to where I was. This works like a stack, so for example, if I go to the definition of this split method, I go to active support. Then inside here, I can also go to the definition of this last, last method here, which returns last method of an array. And I come here. Then I type control T, and I go back once. Control T, and I go back again. And this is really simple. I can even just type here a random string, call it call upcase, for example, type control, and I go to the definition of that method really quickly. So this is really useful for navigating uh, with, within my code. Uh, the other thing I mentioned was Vim Projectionist. So like I said, in Ruby, I have a file called user.rb. I probably have a file called userspec.rb in my test file. At this point, this just has a, a single test. Uh, but if I'm in, in my user file, I can easily type a command, uh, which in my case is space double A, space AA, and it jumps to the to my user spec file, which you can't see the, the header right now, but from here you can see that it's the user spec. If I type the shortcut, I go back to the user. I can also open it in a split or a horizontal split. And again, I don't really have to remember where these files are. This, this is all done automatically by, uh, by these tools. And of course, the clicker stopped working. Just a minute. OK. So one last thing I wanted to live demo really quickly is about TDD. Uh, TDD stands for Test Driven Development. And it's, it's a practice where you, you keep changing your code and running your tests uh, iteratively uh, a lot of times. So you might end up changing uh, even just a single line of code and running your tests again to see if it worked. Uh, and then go back, to, go back to changing again. This, is, this goes all the way back to the feedback loop thing I mentioned earlier. It's something that we're doing uh, all the time if we're doing TDD, so it's also really useful to optimize this. And one thing I see people complaining about or saying that they don't, they don't use TDD because it takes too long to, for them to run their tests, that, uh, I just think that that's kind of a wrong excuse because if your tests take uh, too long to run, uh, then you're probably doing it wrong. Either you have to make, uh, op uh, either optimize your tests or make them run faster, or you have to optimize the way you run your tests. 
And TDD with Vim is actually possible, uh, and it's really easy to do. And that's one, uh, another thing I would like to, to live demo really quickly. So let's say I'm in my, whoops. What's happening? Just a minute. I really have to fix this. So let's say I'm in my user spec file again. I have a single spec. Um, in Vim, I, I actually see a lot of people just uh, getting out of Vim, for example, opening a split and just manually typing the, the, the command to run the test they want. You can't see that, but OK. Uh, the test ran, but this is actually a pretty slow process because for, for one, I have to get out of him, I have to switch context, I have to either type a command again or manually go up and type it again. So in Vim, I use a couple of tools. Uh, there's one called Vim Test and uh, Neo, it's Neo Term or Neo Make, I can't re never remember which one it is. Uh, but what they allow me to do, and there are probably 10 different tools that allow me to do this, but I can simply type a single, a single uh, shortcut and this opens a split inside Vim as well, which runs my tests, uh, pretty much like I did uh, outside of Vim. But with the advantage that I didn't have to type anything, I just said, Vim, run this test file. Uh, and it run, ran the same file that, that I uh, manually ran outside. I can also run, uh, let's go to a, a spec that has more files, for example. This has a few different tests. So let's say, Let's wait a bit. I should optimize this once. OK, never mind. There's way too, too many tests. But I can, I can easily, with different shortcuts, run just this one test where my cursor is in, for example. This time, this is just going to run a single test. There we go. So it's really useful for, for TDD when you don't really want to run your entire test suite. You just want to run a couple of tests that you're interested in. And you don't really have to switch contests, and you, you don't have to remember what commands to type. You just type a single shortcut, and the tools take care of it for you. And so every time I go to live demo, this stops working. <laughs> there we go. So as with anything that I try to optimize, uh, uh, it's important to have data. Uh, if you end up optimizing something that uh, turns out it didn't really need to be optimized, you, you're basically wa wasting time. So I also spend a lot of time trying to learn what exactly should I optimize in, in all these things. What tools should I Im improve? Uh, where should I look next to, to improve my workflow, etc. One important thing is to always be uh, mindful to what you're doing, to take, uh, take a look at what, what you're doing and try to figure out how you could do things better, how you, is there anything in your workflow that, that you're not really happy with and that you think probably should be done a bit faster? Then go, go search for it, go see how everyone else is doing, go see if there's a, a better alternative, because probably there is. And the second thing is to measure. Uh, I mean actually measure what, what I'm doing to get metrics, to get numbers, to see what exactly is worth uh, optimizing next. One simple trick, for example, is a, com uh, a command I have that I call most. Uh, it, it was actually a coworker of mine that came up with this, I think. Uh, this goes to my history file on my terminal and lists uh, all the commands that I type the most uh, and the percentage uh, that I use them. This is how I knew earlier that I use Git more than 20% of my, more than 20% of my terminal commands are Git. So I use Git 20% and CD, Vim, LS, there's a few larger commands here, but since they only amount to like 1% or 2% of my history, it's not really worth optimizing them. I'm, I'm just going to be wasting time trying to learn a new shortcut for something that I, I don't really use that often. And things, for example, things like RSpec, I don't really type RSpec. It's just the tools that I mentioned earlier that type this for me. So they end up in my history in any way. Another thing I'm trying to do uh, recently is to create a heat map of my keyboard to automatically know which keys I'm, I'm pressing and how much I'm pressing them. This can be useful, for example, to know if, I, um, 
if I'm using keys too, too much, for example, if I'm going too much to, to this side of the keyboard, which is out of my comfort zone, I have to move my hand a lot. Uh, not only is that uncomfortable, but it can also be uh, cause uh, damage to my wrists in the long term. Then I know that's something that I should try to optimize. Uh, and also, if I see that I'm using uh, these keys in the middle very often, that's a good thing because that's where my hands are more comfortable. So I know that I'm doing uh, what I should be doing. But again, uh, this needs to be measured uh, to, to actually have data on, on it and to, to know uh, where, where to look next. And another, another cool thing uh, I, I like to do is to see how everyone else is doing this. How not only the, the pros, uh, the, like the rock star programmers are doing this, but basically everyone else. There's a couple of suggestions I have for this. There's um, a series of screencasts called Play by Play uh, that were made a, a few years ago, I think, uh, that uh, where the host, Geoffrey Grosenbach, uh, does pair programming with uh, some fam famous developers, mostly famous in the Ruby community, I think. Uh, and he pairs program with them to solve uh, a random problem. But the, the focus here is to see how they approach the problem, how they use the, uh, their tools, and how they think. So that's really useful to see how, the, how really successful people uh, do their work. And an another thing is Twitch. This used to be just for gaming, but uh, re pretty recently it's, uh, it's getting... People are go uh, going on Twitch to do live coding. That's a thing now. Um, the, uh, I, see, I see a lot of developers I know live coding on Twitch, and it's also interesting to see their, their daily work because you can learn a few tricks fr from them uh, that way. And so, uh, one last thing. Uh, optimize, to optimize my workflow, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't just have to be about software. Uh, we can look at, for example, our hardware as well. One thing that uh, actually most developers at our company are pretty, have pretty strong feelings about is our keyboard. This is called the Kinesis. One, 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 one of us in Braga has, has one of these. Uh, if you've never seen one of these, you can see that the layout is actually pretty, pretty weird. It's, it's pretty different from a conventional keyboard. Uh, but this, this is actually more ergonomic layout. Uh, it's, uh, once you end up learning how to use this, it gets really comfortable and maybe even faster to use as well. So this, this also has a very steep learning curve, but uh, if, you're, if it's something you're interested in, uh, the, in the long run, it ends up being a, a really nice thing to try. And this is a picture of my, my own keyboard and from a few others at our company. This is called an Ergodox, and it's a completely open source keyboard, both the hardware and the firmware. Uh, and this basically has the same layout as the, the Kinesis that I mentioned before, but this is com completely hackable. I can, I can change the, f the firmware. I can, uh, uh, I can easily do the heat map thing I mentioned earlier with this keyboard. There's actually a, a guy that already did it. Uh, that's what I'm basing myself in. Uh, I can define macros. I can customize the whole keyboard, make it do a whole, whole bunch of crazy things that I couldn't do on a basic keyboard. But this doesn't really have to be the... Um, to be what, what, uh, you, you don't really have to do this to, to be better at your work. You can, you can, you can s simply be productive with a, with a basic keyboard. Be so, some of us do as well, and they have no problem with it. It's just something that if you're interested in doing, uh, and, and you, you like messing around with that kind of stuff, I definitely recommend it. But it's definitely not... Um, a must thing. You don't, you, don't, you don't need to feel that you must have the latest high-tech keyboard to, to be a good developer. So to recap, uh, I just wanted to say that look at your tools, look at how you're using them, try to come up with more clever ways to, to do your work and see where, where you could potentially improve. Uh, learn to use your tools better, uh, go research what, uh, what you can do with them, how to, how to do uh, that one thing you didn't know you, you, you could do. Or if you find out that those tools do, uh, don't really serve your purpose, then learn better ones. And finally, uh, learn, from, uh, learn from the best, learn from pe people around you. Every, everyone might have interesting tips to share uh, on this. And it, uh, it can get pretty, pretty interesting to, to share that knowledge. Thank you.
Any questions? Two questions. Uh, okay. Uh, first one is, uh, how do you feel using uh, a different layout, as in a different, not QWERTY, nor uh, Dvorak, as considering it, it would be possible? A different layout other than QWERTY? Uh, yeah, because uh, let's say it's, uh, QWERTY is standard. Uh, yeah. Everyone knows QWERTY. Uh, if I were to use your, your keyboard, uh, I would not know what to do. <laughs> I, I have to be honest, because from what you, what you showed, it's completely out of place. Uh, this one? Um, no, the, the heat map. I, oh, the heat map thing. Yeah. That yeah, one. yeah. Th this photo is, has a different layout. This is not the one I use. It's just the first photo of a heat okay. map I found on Google. OK. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, I actually, uh, a different layout is something that I'm interested in trying. Uh, but it's something that takes a lot of time to learn and okay. a lot of practice. I bought, I bought this keyboard uh, almost a year ago, uh, and so I didn't, uh, I didn't really want to try a new layout uh, at the same time. I already moved a, a lot of keys to learn, to learn this keyboard, as you can see. Learning a, a new layout, as you said, QWERTY is not, is not really uh, optimized. There, there are a lot of studies around that. Uh, it's something that I also want to do uh, somewhere in the future, but uh, it, it takes a, a, lot of, a lot of effort to learn, yeah. Yeah, the, um, the question was just because you have to learn the, the layout, but you cannot forget QWERTY because someday we'll have to use it. The second question is uh, reds, browns, or blacks? Uh, sorry? Did reds, browns, or blacks? I didn't, I'm not, not, not getting uh, that. Your sorry. switch. You, you, hmm? you, have a, you have a mechanical keyboard, right? I, the color of the switches? Yeah. Oh, uh, it's uh, brown. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I, w I wasn't really getting that. Um, any, any more questions? Ah. Yeah. I, n I noticed something on your Tmux uh, in the bottom part. There was a uh, get to work. Oh, <laughs> OK. Uh, I could have talked about that, actually. <laughs> Where is that? I have Tmux here. What? Well, I can. OK. Uh, this part get to work? Yes, yes. OK, this is uh, a bit unrelated, but we use, uh, so in our company, we need to track time. And at, at this, uh, right now, we're using Harvest. Uh, and it's really boring to use. So what me and I think uh, he, he came up with this, actually. Uh, there's, a, there's a, a command line tool called time trap, which allows me to just with a single command say I'm starting this task, I'm finishing this task, and it tracks my time. There's also a plugin that sub s takes that report from time trap and submits that to harvest, which I use at the end of the day. And this just, is just a command that refreshes every two seconds that goes to my time trap status, takes the tag, which uh, anything that starts with a net sign, so that it, it tells me, either it tells me what project I'm currently tracking, or it just says get to work to remind me that that's it. Cool, thanks. And also, can you compare Control P versus Fuzzy Finder? Uh, uh, Control P, it's, it's sort of similar. It's, it's oh, yeah. Uh, Control P, that's what I used before. Fuzzy Finder, I, find, I find out, found, found out about it a couple uh, months ago, maybe. Uh, I use the same shortcut. It's Control P as well, uh, because I already used Control P. Uh, the difference is that uh, the Fuzzy Finder also integrates with uh, AG or HipGrab. Uh, so it, uh, I have the same interface uh, for those two. Uh, also, f Fuzzy Finder, let me see my, if I'm not saying anything wrong. Uh, I believe it's more efficient, just that. And it, it also allows me to, in it also integrates with a lot of other tools. For example, uh, do you know, how do you, do you know Tmux? So you know Tmux sessions. One thing I, I also do with Fuzzy Finder that I can show, if my caps lock didn't mess up every time. So I can have a couple of Tmux sessions. Uh, and I, uh, I also have a shortcut that opens uh, FCF uh, with a list of all the Tmux sessions except the, cur the current one I'm in. So I can have a session for each project and use FCF to switch bet between them uh, easily. 
So I, uh, FCF, you, you can pipe it easily, like I showed. You can, you can just pipe FCF on anywhere uh, in Tmux, in uh, the terminal, and it works really well. Anything else? How long did it t took to master Vim? <laughs> I started, what, second, third year university? <laughs> That, that, that was when? 2010? It's five, six years by now. I, I've used it before, and just to try it out. I started using it 100% uh, when I was finishing my third year of university, maybe. So maybe five, six years uh, until now, I'd say. But no one, is, no one masters him. That's, that doesn't happen. Okay, that's it. Thank you.